What's up everybody? This is Sean Donovan again. Thank you for coming to the channel. Now that the mini bike is done, we can go a little bit further in detail on some of the uh, systems and how things are, are working. Um, in this video, we're just going to talk about the structure, the frame and the seat and, and all the things you might need to know there. Just briefly touch on it. We're going to go and talk about the power source, which is the batteries and the chargers for the batteries, as well as the motors. We are going to talk about how we're controlling the actual mini bike and, and the motor speed, which gets into a little bit of code, not a ton of code, mostly just PWM signals, square waves, and uh, some converters. And then finally, we're going to top it off with assembly. Um, and by that, I just mean how everything's working together, um, top speed, torque, that sort of thing. So let's get started. All right, first we're gonna talk about the structure. That is everything in black here on our little handy dandy diagram. Um, we have the battery mount, the frame, the seat, the handlebars, that's about it. I did draw the, um, the rear gears and the front gears in black too, but that doesn't really matter. All that you really need to know is that the mini bike frame itself is steel, which is really strong, but really heavy. Um, we could go into a lot of calculations on stresses and bending and you know stability and all that, but we're not going to do that because that's really in depth. Uh, we just want to know that the 12 volt batteries are going to be secured there, which they are. Uh, we've kind of covered how we mounted those in a previous video. Um, it was pretty nice that all of the top part of the frame had a little flat piece of metal welded between it. Um, there was actually some holes pre-drilled for switches. I don't know if the other previous owner had switches in there or not, but there was a, a couple switches up front that we used, um, and then there was holes already in there for mounting a seat. The seat I got was a little longer than those holes, so I ended up having to mount the back of it into the aluminum, uh, which turned out fine, so no worries there. Um, other than that, the, the final thing we're going to just briefly touch on is the axles. When you run the axles through your frame or through your, your metal tabs or whatever have you there, you're going to want either some sort of uh, bearing, um, actually any kind of bearing really would work in there if you can mount it properly, or uh, some sort of you know friction reducing sleeve that will prevent the, the axle from bouncing up and down in the, in the hole. Because when you're riding you don't want it to be bouncing all over the place, that's how you break things. All right, so let's move on to the power source and the motors. Uh, we did cover this a little bit in previous videos. I uh, kind of walked you through series in parallel and how we set up the batteries to get the voltage that we wanted. But just to reiterate, um, the motors that we used were 24 volts, which means they need 24 volt power supply to run at their full potential. Um, I had six 12 volt batteries, they're all the little things so um, just a refresher if you connect batteries in series that means you do plus to minus and then plus to minus plus to minus plus to minus you're adding voltages so what I did for these 12 volt batteries is I took three sets of two and I put them in series so 12 volt plus 12 volt is 24 volts that's one battery pack and we did that two other times uh, and then if you connect batteries in parallel which means you do plus to plus minus to minus, and then take those out to your your uh, whatever needs the power, you're going to be adding the amp hours or increasing the duration of your battery. Um, so what we did here is we combined our 12 volt batteries in series to create three separate 24 volt packs. Then we put all three of those in parallel and that increased our duration by three times. Um, you can think of it kind of like if you are trying to drink out of a straw. If you're drinking out of a straw from one cup, um, you're gonna drain that cup pretty quick, but if that straw is split between three different cups, each one of those cups will drain a lot slower. Anyways, we have this onboard charger as well. I'm not gonna get super deep into that. Basically, it's a transformer with some extra components to monitor the batteries and make sure they're safe and they don't overcharge or heat up too much. Um, we can do a different video about transformers if you'd like just leave a comment below let me know that you'd be interested in that 
Um, but basically we're taking in 115 volts or 120 volts from your wall and it's converting it to just over 24 volts maybe. I think it's around 28 volts maybe. Um, you need the higher voltage in the charger in order to push electricity back into the batteries once they've drained. Because an actual 24 volt pack is actually higher voltage than 24 volts. It's 25, 26. I think you saw that in one of the other videos. So that's just there and wires in and charges the batteries. Not much to say there. Now, if we want to talk about the motors, this is where things get interesting. Um, there are a few different kinds of motors. There's AC and DC, first of all, that's the first kind of division. Um, that's alternating current for AC and direct current for DC. Within DC, there's a few different ones. There's brushed DC and there's brushless DC. Um, the brush less is going to be a little more efficient, we'll get to that. But the ones that I have here are brushed DC motors, um, and that's represented by this drawing up here. So the dash line, you may or may not be able to see it, that is supposed to be the motor housing, that's the metal part on the outside that you can touch and you can see and all that. Within that, there are two parts. There's the stator, which is going to be comprised of permanent magnets, north and south. And then there's the rotor, which is the shaft, and that's the part that rotates. So you can think of it as rotor, rotates, stator, stays put. Um, on a brushed DC motor, which we have here, they're very simple, very durable, um, also very heavy, but they are very simple. And that is because you don't need any extra controllers. All that's happening inside, pretty much, is you have these little brushes, physical metal brushes, and they run around the inside. They are stationary, and when the rotor rotates, um, it changes the contact point of those brushes. So they're kind of sitting like this, and then you're spinning something in the middle. So on the actual rotor, um, you can see there's some different slots and different contacts, and each one of those contacts corresponds to a different coil winding. Um, when you run current through a coil of wire, it produces an electromagnetic field, that field will want to align with the magnetic field of the magnets on the outside on the stator. So when I, if let's say my uh, rotor is this way, if I apply current to this coil, it might want to snap this way to align with the magnets. So as it rotates, the brushes then will come off the contact that allows the current to flow and it will pick up on a new coil. So on this one now, and now that one wants to align while this one just continues rotating, and so on and so on, and that is how your motor spins. You're just continuously energizing new coils, which then, each time you energize it, they want to align with the magnetic field of the magnets. So, moving on to brushless DC motors. They have no brushes, that's in the name, um, but um, they are a little bit more complicated. You'll need a controller for them because the motor controller is telling the motor when to fire the current through the magnetic coils. Um, on this one, this is just a simple drawing. There's tons of different kinds. I put the uh, coils of wire on the stator and on the rotor is actually the permanent magnets. So um, basically it's the same thing as what we were talking about up here where if my, my rotor is this way, and I energize the top coil, maybe it wanna, it'll want to align with that magnetic field and then so on and so on, we're, we're rotating. But because the motor doesn't have the brushes to tell it when it turns on and off, this is just a passive way to do it because the brushes are either contacting or they're not. This way requires an encoder or some other type of sensing thing that will tell you the, the position of the shaft. So let's say my north pole is off to the right and the motor doesn't know that and it tries to energize south pole or something, some other place that it's not supposed to go. It may or may not attract in the right direction, so you could spin the opposite direction. Now with uh, an encoder, it will tell the motor, hey, I'm closer to this coil. That's the one that needs to fire now. So it will send the current through the coil, create the magnetic field, and your, your rotor will want to align with that field. Then when it gets to a certain point, and the encoder is telling it, it's going to sit on the end of the shaft or some other way. The encoder tells it to turn off and turn on the next one. And so you continue your rotation that way. A good way to think about this is if you're pushing your friends on a merry-go-round or something back in the day, you know. And an example of the brush DC would be if your eyes are open, you can see your friend coming, 
and they reach out their hand and they say, all right, grab my hand and pull. So you can see them every time they come around, you can grab their hand and pull. That's pretty easy. You know it's coming and you can hit it every time. Now, if you're a Brussels DC motor, you don't know when they're coming. You don't know where they are. It's almost as if you have a blindfold on and they can't yell to you to say, okay, I'm coming around. That's what you need the encoder for. The encoder might be like a third person standing there saying, all right, get ready. They're coming around. They're, they're at one quarter, an eighth. Okay, now. And then you can reach out and pull them along. That might be a little bit of a stretch for an example, but uh, hopefully it makes sense. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about code and control. As you've seen before, we are using an Arduino microcontroller. It's an Arduino Uno, to be specific. We are also using motor controller back here, and that is a Sabertooth 2x25 motor controller. That just means it can control two motors up to 25 amps each. Um, the reason that we're using these things is because we need some way to give inputs to the motor controller. It can take in a lot of different signals. It can take in like an RC signal if you want to do remote control stuff. Um, it can take in serial signal if it's you know plugged into a, a computer or otherwise getting a serial signal, which you can output with Arduino. Um, the easiest way that I found though was to do PWM from Arduino. Now PWM stands for Pulse Width Modulation, which sounds really fancy. It's really not. You're just adjusting the width of a pulse. Modulation just means you're you're changing it and pulse width is just pretty self-explanatory. So let's come look over here at these blue graphs here. Um, we'll start with two and a half because that's the easiest one to understand. These are your pulses. These are pulses up to five volts. The Arduino will run on a zero to five volt um, range. And so these are gonna be your pulses. Now how PWM works is that you kind of take the average of your, of your pulses so they're either zero or five volts. So at two and a half volts, if we want to send a signal to the motor controller that's two and a half volts, we will send half the time zero volts and half the time five volts. Half time zero, half time five. The average of that then is two and a half. So that's what the motor controller is going to see. Now the motor controller specifically sees two and a half to five volts as forward and just under two and a half to zero as full reverse. So in this case, we want it always to go forward because you don't want to be running the motor backwards. Um, so I'm only doing this to five volts, but let's talk about some of the other ones. If I did want to send zero volts, this would be kind of how the graph would look. It would just be zero, not sending anything. No waves, no, no squares, nothing, just zero volts. And if we want to do five volts, we would just jump up to five volts and just stay there. So that, those are pretty easy. Where it becomes kind of tricky, but also kind of cool is when you want to do something in between zero and five volts that's not two and a half. Two and a half is really easy. Half on, half off, half on, half off, and on and on. This one down here is uh, just a repre representation of four volts. So you can see there's a really skinny, small portion of time it's at zero volts, and then a longer portion of time it's at five volts. So a small portion at zero, longer portion of time at five. Small, big, small, big, small. So the average then would be four volts. It's seeing over some average amount of time. Whatever, whatever time you pick, it will see an average of four volts. Um, correction, not any amount of time. You have to have at least one full wave. But I think you get the point. Now over here would have one volt, so we're spending more time at zero. A little bit of time at five volts, zero for a longer period of time, and then a small portion of time at five volts. So there's some, some modulation there. Uh, where it becomes really interesting is if you do something like this. If you're trying to create a sine wave, so you're trying to show the motor controller a wave that goes from, I don't know, two and a half to five and back down to two and a half. This is kind of what I was trying to draw there. So you want it to be nice and smooth so your motor will speed will go woo. Good sound effects, I know. Anyways, if you wanted to do something like that, you would be modulating your pulse width, kind of like this, where while you're ramping up to the five volts, your pulses would spend longer and longer periods of time at five volts, and they would also be really close together. And then when you start decreasing, your pulses would become farther and farther apart, spending more time at zero. Um, and that would drop your, 
your average voltage down to the two and a half. So this is actually how VFDs work, and VFDs are variable frequency drives. Those are like, you might know about them, they're mostly for AC motors, um, higher voltages, that sort of thing. You'll take in a high voltage AC and then convert it to DC, and then you'll use a VFD to convert to something like this. So you'd be using the VFD to control an AC motor, there are a lot of reasons for that. We can talk about that too. If you would like a video on VFDs, leave a comment below. Um, but that's kind of going to bring us into digital to analog converters and analog to digital converters. Now the Arduino does not technically have a digital to analog converter, which by its in quotes, that's more of a VFD, variable frequency drive. Um, but it does output PWM. Now when we say digital, we're saying something's on or off, ones and zeros, definite states, kind of like this square wave. It's either zero or one or zero or, you know, in this case, zero to five. So we're saying it has definite states. We want to, if we wanted to turn that into an analog signal, we would have to do something like this. Um, but that takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of speed and, and processing power. So what Arduino does is it takes um, this five volts and it chops it into 256 little pieces. So little tiny voltage steps for each one of these. Now we get 256 from the um, chip that it uses to do that. It's an 8-bit conversion. Um, bits are just ones or zeros. We're getting kind of deep into the computer language now, but bits are ones and zeros, and we have eight positions to fill in that string. So if you do two to the eight, because you can have eight eight numbers of one, or you can have zero with seven ones, or you can have zero, one, one, zero, zero, you know, tons of different combinations. So we're gonna do two to the eight, um, which will give us the 256 different combinations for that string, which will produce different combinations of our PWM. Now, when you are coding in Arduino, you can only enter a value from zero to 255, which sounds confusing, except that zero counts as a value. So we have zero, and then we have 1 to 255. So that gives us our 256 total points. And as I said before, we are chopping our 5 volts into 256 different pieces. So we can do different voltage steps, and that will give us different voltage modulation down here, kind of like this. So that's what we're going to use in the code. Now, Arduino does have an analog to digital converter. It is a 12-bit converter. So let's say you are feeding in a sine wave like this, uh, zero to five volts, and you want analog, you want the Arduino to give you a feedback on that so you can do something with that number or so you can read the voltage. Now, it would be really nice if it would just say, oh, you're at five volts, you're at four volts, you're at three volts, but that's not how it works. Um, like I said before, it has a 12-bit 12 12-bit 12 analog to digital converter, and it's similar to the digital to analog converter um, in that it breaks up your voltage into smaller pieces. But this one has a higher bit count, which means that we have uh, 12 positions to fill with zeros and ones instead of eight, which gives us more uh, variation, more possible options to have as that string. So we will actually come out with 1024, 1024 different combinations that we could have. And when you're actually breaking down this five volt signal, because that's what you can put into the Arduino, you'll actually come out with 0 0.005 volts, roughly, per step. So if I tell the Arduino to, uh, if the Arduino is reading one, it is actually reading 0 0.005 volts. So it's kind of just a, a conversion between Arduino language and what we want to see. Because we want to see voltage. We want to see, yeah, we're, we're reading five volts, we're reading four volts, right? Um, so as an example, let's say I do want to read 4 volts. Uh, we can then do some math and figure out what our value would be that we would get back from Arduino if it was reading 4 volts. So, pretty simple math. We're going to say, all right, we have 4 volts and it's out of 5. We know that it's 4 out of 5. We're almost there, but we want to know what it is in our numbers down here in bits. So we take our 1024, we have our question mark, we do a little bit of math, and we come out to about 820 um, for our value for five, four volts. 
Now that's, if I'm putting in four volts to the Arduino and I'm looking on a screen and it says 819.2 or 820, I will now know that that's about four volts. So you can double check this with this math. So we already said that we took our five volts and we divided it into 1,024 pieces, which came out to 0 0.005 volts per step, per piece. So if you multiply 0 0.005 by our 819.2, you'll come out to about 4.01 volts. Um, I did do some rounding here and there, so it's not exactly four volts, but it's close enough. I think you get the point. So all of this is very important for a few reasons. Um, if you're taking in a four volt signal and you wanna translate that to some sort of um, square wave. So let's say I have a potentiometer, which is uh, just a, a turnable resistor. It, it's a variable resistor with a knob. We've talked about it in uh, one of the other videos, but that will read zero to five volts. I'll run five volts across that and I will be able to adjust the voltage that gets to the Arduino. So the Arduino will be getting some wave like this if I'm turning the knob back and forth at a constant rate, it'll get something like this. So if I want to have that be my, my input, if I'm sitting there with a knob and I wanna use that knob to change the speed of the motors, I will send in this signal. The Arduino will convert it to this. So if I have it set at four volts, it will spit back out at me 819.2. As a number, I can sort in a variable and. and we can really get into Arduino stuff in a different video. Uh, but it'll, it'll put back 819.2. Now that obviously doesn't fit in our range here. And if I'm sending, if I want to send four volts um, to the motor controller, I have to do it in some, for, some form or fashion that the motor controller can see. So 819 does not fit into this range. But if we do more math, um, and actually Arduino has a really fancy piece of code that allows you to just map stuff. So you can map 0 to 1024, uh, or 0 to 1023, I apologize, because 0 counts. You can map that value to 0 to 255, and then it will automatically convert 819 into whatever its equivalent is in this range. So anyway, this is important because once we have 819.2, we can do math or use the map function and we can convert it to something in this range. Then when we do this range, um, we can do an analog write. Now it sounds like analog, um, analog write is the uh, function on Arduino, but it actually is not writing analog signals, it is writing PWM. Which is why we need to know this, why we need to know that, because we need to be able to take our input, which could be analog, and convert it into a semi-analog output. So by varying that potentiometer that we were just talking about, I can change the value over there. That will then get converted here. So if I change my value, if I just twist the knob all the way up to five volts, um, the Arduino will then read it as 1023. I can convert that over here, and that will actually be 255. And then I can send the value of 255 as a square wave. In this case, that would be full five volts, which is just this one here. And we're off to the races. We are going full power. All right, now that we covered all of the other stuff, let's get to the assembly part of things. So we kind of know how all of this is interacting. We know how the batteries are powering the motors, how they're being, how that flow of energy is being controlled by the motor controller and the Arduino. Um, we know how the energy is sort of flowing in the motor itself. Um, so let's see kind of the bigger picture, how all of that energy is moving the mini bike. Um, we are going to be figuring out theoretically the top speed of the mini bike. Don't cheat and look down there, but actually it's right there. So uh, we're gonna figure this out using a few knowns. So I had to go down and measure some things. We need to know uh, the motor RPM. So I looked that up online it says uh, 2650 may or may not be true I have not tested it myself and then I did some just some rough measurements here with a ruler so it's probably not super accurate but it's close enough um, we're gonna need to know the motor gear diameter that's this little guy right here or this guy right here we're gonna need to know the wheel diameter obviously the, the tire here and we're going to need to know the wheel gear 
So either this one or this one. Now that came out to one, 10, and four and a half inches respectively. First thing we're gonna do is figure out what the gear ratio is. That is the difference in size between the motor gear and the sprocket or the wheel gear. Um, changing that ratio will change speed, acceleration, and uh, longevity of uh, the batteries really, or, or how long you can run. Really. So first thing we're gonna do is figure out what the gear ratio is. The formula we're gonna use is driven over driving. So that means we're gonna be uh, taking the the wheel gear, I'm sorry, yeah, the wheel gear, which is being driven by the motor, and we're going to divide it by the driving gear. So we have our wheel gear divided by the motor gear in inches. That's four and a half over one, so our gear ratio is four and a half. That means for every four and a half rotations of the motor, this is gonna rotate one time. So we can do one, two, three, four and a half, Now that's going to be important for a few things. Uh, we're going to say that's constant. We're going to say we can't change that ratio, even though you can. If you buy a different gear for the motor or a different gear for the back, you can change that ratio to get more torque or more top speed or something like that. But for this example, we're going to maintain that ratio, and we're going to first figure out what the RPM, what the rotations per minute are of the, the wheel. Um, that's going to be based off of the RPM of the motor, we're going to assume maximum speed and uh, the ratio. So all we're going to do here is we're going to take our motor RPM, 2650, and we're going to divide it by our gear ratio because of what I said before where we're doing four rotations per one back here. So if I'm spinning this at 2650 rotations per minute, then when we get to the big gear we're only going to be spinning um, one divided by 4.5 of that. And that comes out to about 590 rotations per minute. 489, if you're doing that um, exactly. So, that's good to know. That, that means that this shaft, anything on this axle shaft, is gonna be spinning about 590 rotations per minute maximum. Um, so from here, we need to know the tire size because if I put something really, really big on there, it'll still be spinning at 589 rotations per minute, it's just, it's gonna be covering a lot more distance. So we need to know the circumference of this tire. So if you took a piece of string and held it here, wrapped it around your tire, and then took it off, stretched it straight, and measured it, that is how far you would actually roll for one revolution. Now that's gonna matter when we get two miles per hour. Um, so we're gonna find the circumference of the 10 inch diameter wheel first. Circumference is two times pi times r. R is the radius, so it's just half the diameter. So we got two pi times five. That comes out to about 31.4 inches per revolution. So for every one revolution of these tires, we are moving 31.4 inches. Um, we can then multiply that by our rotations per minute, which we found here based off the gear ratio, 589. So we'll do 31.4 times 589. That will cancel out our revolution unit and leave us in inches per minute. Um, now, inches per minute doesn't really mean anything to anyone. I mean, unless you're like really good, then props to you. But I don't know how fast 18,495 inches per minute is. I, I just, I don't know what that is. So then we're gonna just do some quick math down here, get clear of some units, and we come out to about 17 and a half miles per hour, top speed. So, um, Obviously we know that's not true. This is all theoretical and when I'm riding it, I'm about 190 pounds. So it's a lot of, lot of weight to move. Um, I'm probably not getting to this peak 2,650 RPM. Maybe if I'm going downhill, but uh, I'd say we're probably around 12, maybe 10 uphill. So it's, it's not a terrible approximation. Um, and you know, these can be more accurate and um, we can do some actual testing of the maximum RPM of the motors if we really wanted to, but it, it's good enough. 17 and a half miles per hour. That's about what the, what they'd be doing if, uh, you know, maybe if I was like 50 pounds or 100 pounds or something. Maybe we'd, we'd be going quick. Plus, there's a lot of extra friction. I have chain tensioners on there. Keep that chain tensioned. 
Um, it's got the rolling friction if you don't pump up the tires enough. And the thing itself, with all the batteries and the chargers and the motors and all that, it's pretty heavy. So it's probably about, I don't know, 250 pounds of stuff moving with just these two little motors. And that's definitely not what they're used for. Not what they're made for, anyway. Anyways, moving on, um, we had briefly discussed if you change these gear, you could change the gear ratio and then change your acceleration or change your top speed. But I said we're going to keep them constant. So let's say that we can change the tire diameter. Let's say we can put a really big one on or a really small one on. Now obviously it can't be smaller than the gear because otherwise we'd just be grinding the gear on the ground. So let's say we can go small, a little bit, and infinite. Obviously that won't work either because we'll run into the frame and have other issues. But for the sake of discussion, we're going to talk about torque and torque is just the radius around the axle or the radius around the point that you're putting the force on times the force. So if you have um, a really big radius um, for a normal amount of force, let's, let's say the force is 10 pounds. You're pulling with 10 pounds on a super small radius, you'll have not a lot of torque, or if you have a really big radius, which is why torque bars and torque wrenches are usually pretty long if you need to do a lot of torque, you can still pull with that 10 pounds of force, but down at the axle, because this length is so long, this radius, you're actually gonna have a lot more force down there. So um, this is our gear, this is our tire, and if we assume this gear is not changing size, like we were saying, then we also assume that the force on the chain is constant. We're running, let's say we're running the motors max power and it's running super smooth and, and constant. So we're gonna say this force and, and the torque on this, excuse me, the torque on this gear is constant. Now, let's say it's 10 pounds and the radius is one inch, which is not true, but we'd have um, the torque of 10 pound inches. But now that we know the torque and we know, we'll know the radius of the wheel from here is um, here, five inches. So we'll have 10 pound inches and we wanna know the force down here on the, on the ground that it's actually applying so that the reaction force will move you forward. That is gonna be uh, calculated by dividing the torque by the radius because we know torque and radius, we don't know the forces. So we have our torque of 10 inch pounds and we're gonna divide it by five inches. So we'd have two pounds of force down there. Now that's, that's just a very theoretical number I just picked for no reason. But it serves a purpose in saying that if we make this radius really big and we maintain our torque around this axis with the chain and the motor and all that, if we make the motor really big, our 10 inch pounds is still staying the same from that example. But now the radius, let's say the radius is 10 inches. Um, we do 10 divided by 10, now we're at only one pound down here instead of two. So a bigger tire is going to give you less torque, so you're not going to accelerate as fast. But, let's say our radius was that 10. If we plug it in over here to the 10, this would be doubled up to like 62-ish. This would be doubled 36-ish, and this would be up around 34. So you get a higher top speed because with a given rotation per minute, a given speed, you are gonna be covering more ground. That's the whole string around the, around the wheel thing. Now, if we shrunk this, shrunk it really close to the, to the gear there, our radius would decrease. So previously we said it was 10. Let's say it's, let's say it's one, you know, that's not real, but let's say it's one. And we still have our 10 um, inch pounds over here divided by one, we will end up with 10 pounds of force down here. So we'll have a lot higher force where the, where the rubber meets the road. So we'll accelerate a lot faster, but then if we carry that into our circumference calculation over here, we'll drop this by a factor of five, and our top speed will be one fifth of what it is, maybe five miles an hour if I'm rounding this up to 20. I'm sorry, four miles an hour if I'm running this up to 20. So we'll get a lot lower top speed, but we'll be able to get up and go faster. So I'm not gonna change anything on the mini bike because it seems to perform fine for what it is, and I kind of like it that way. So, anyways, I'm glad you stuck around and watched the rest of that video, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad we got to talk about this. If you want to talk about anything else on the mini bike, if I missed anything, if you have other suggestions for topics, let me know. Leave some comments down below. 
Um, definitely subscribe if you haven't done that because I'm going to be putting out some good stuff. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed the build. Hope you enjoyed the mini bike. See you next time.